Right after I graduated college, I had an opportunity to work with an HIV positive population that was just when AIDS was coming out. And during that time, I had the chance to um, work with some really young girls, 11, 12 years old, held a lot of sweet hands while they were dying. And um, I don't think that ever left me. Was on staff um, in Women's Mysteries for nearly nine years when I just started feeling like I was, um, God was making me restless, pouring over scripture and it was um, just breaking my heart in new ways. And I would come across these passages and I would just, they would make me weep because I really um, was struck with, do I do this? Do I live this way? Do I feed the hungry? Do I clothe the naked? Do I visit the prisoner? Do I take in the homeless? Like, do, what do, do I, how do I do these things? I had this idea that uh, I wanted to work with women who had been rescued from sex trafficking. Naomi's house opened in December of 2016, and they were hiring for a direct care position, and I had had a background in social services and a background in ministry. These really blended the two of those things. I was asked to co-lead the weekly Bible study here. I was a little nervous, but I thought, what a privilege that would be to get to spend time with these women and open God's word with them. And so shortly after the house opened, I began serving in that capacity, coming here to spend time, hear a little bit of the women's stories, and just point to, to the many ways that we could find in scripture where the Lord saw and cared for women. When I first started working at Naomi's house, I had this opportunity to give a woman a tour, and she couldn't stop crying the whole time. She came in, she took one look around at this beautiful place, and she just started crying. I'm used to that. I knew that women come here and it's, it's the most beautiful place I've ever lived. I can't, you know, started apologizing for crying. And I said, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, that's it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. And she said, do you think I could have a hug? And I said, oh, sweetheart, of course. Of course you can have a hug. And so I hugged her and she just sobbed in my arms. Um, and she said, I can't remember the last time I was hugged. And I thought, here's a woman who's touched 24 hours a day, practically, in ugly, ugly ways, and beaten and broken. Um, but she hadn't had someone hold her in a way that was caring in years, years. It's beautiful to see the transformation that comes I got to see a woman attend church and have her mom join her at church for the first time and have that, that, that mom witness and see her daughter worshiping the Lord and singing a song that talks about coming up out of the grave and seeing this mom witness that her daughter really has been brought back to life. I've come to see that I'm not very different from these ladies. They're precious and they're brave and in their brokenness, I see my own. And through interacting with them, coming to know them, my hope is just getting bigger as I see the work that the Lord is doing in them and their eyes are opened when they're, they come back to life, when they start dreaming and planning for their futures. I just think, oh, there's no situation, there's no person on this earth where God can't bring healing. I'm so, so, so thankful for stories like that stories of uh, Kim and Chris and, and their service at Naomi's house. And you can hear more about Naomi's house if you'd like to and, and hear more about their story. Um, it's, and, and for many, many of you who are doing the best you can to make a difference, I, I love what Kim said in the video. Reading Jesus' call to, to feed the 
hungry, to care for the broken, to visit people who are sick, and asking yourself, do I do this, and how do I do this? And that's not something that the professional ministers do. It's something that Jesus followers do, Christians do. We all should be doing. And so uh, to those of you who are wrestling through what that means for you and what that looks like in your life, I want to say thank you. We're glad that you're part of this. That's what we're here for. Last week I was in Toronto. Actually, I was in Oro Medante, Canada. It's the middle of nowhere, Canada, with a group of pastors that I've been journeying with a couple times a year. For a number of years, we've been learning from each other, going to learn from different leaders, and we visited a guy named Kerry Newhoff, the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast in this middle of nowhere Canada studio is reaching leaders around the world. Spent some time with him, and then we uh, went to visit this church that he started, uh, and in Canada, he said they, they're reaching millennials, or y- Gen Z, we call them, uh, the next generation, young people uh, in droves, and uh, there's a real kind of a gap in leadership there. And so talk about leadership development, and we had a great time with them. And I met a young woman who said, you know, we stopped calling ourselves Christians here. I said, oh, okay, tell me about that. She said, well, we were just using the phrase Jesus followers because Christian has a, it kind of has a bad uh, taste to it in Canada. And I can understand that. I've heard similar things about views of Christianity in America. It's not the first time I've heard that sort of thing. And she said, we just call ourselves Jesus followers. But historically speaking, that's what the term Christian means. Christ, it, the word comes from the Latin, Christianos, it means those of Christ, the Christ ones, the Jesus followers. That's what the term means. In fact, the first time that's ever used, only three times in the New Testament, the word Christian is used is in Acts 11. The c- disciples were called Christians. The believers were called Christians first in a city called Antioch. It was a term given by the Greeks and the Romans who weren't believers of these crazy Jesus people because of the way that they lived. Those are the Christians, the Christ ones. First Peter 4, 16, it says, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. You bear his name. You belong to him. But what do Christians do? I think one of the reasons that the, this young woman said she and her friends wanted not to call themselves Christians is because people, she, in her words, think Christians are weird. They do weird stuff. Okay, maybe that's true. Maybe we're a little weird. Maybe you're here thinking, yes, you are weird. I'm not a Christian yet, but I came, and this is weird. Uh, it reminds me of a story I heard when I was in England earlier this spring about a guy who um, had come to Christ, faith in Jesus Christ, and then w- but he was an artist and a percussionist, and he was, they were traveling around with this group in Africa, reaching thousands of people through these worship concerts and evangelistic crusades and healing ministries, and he got invited to play along with this band on stage in this open-air concert in front of thousands. But he said they already had a drummer, and they didn't have any percussion instruments. All they had, he said, was this banana-shaped shaker, one of these. So I ordered this online, because that's what he said. So I'm on the stage in the open air in Africa in front of thousands of people, and I'm in the back just doing this, like this. Except it wasn't amplified, and you couldn't hear it. So to the people in the audience, it's just a guy shaking a banana. Just on stage doing this, you know? He said afterwards, a woman waited around to talk to him, like waited around after all the prayer was over. Like for a long time, he came up to him and said, I was so moved by by what was going on here, but I have to ask you, what is the significance of the banana? (laughs) I love this thing, but you Christians are weird. Why are you shaking a banana? What does it mean, God? You know, like, and he used that to say, sometimes the stuff that we do in church or Christian stuff, if you don't know, this looks like shaking, in his words, Shaking a banana, right? Just on stage shaking bananas. What are you doing? Well, let's talk about what is it that Christians really are called to do. What is it we do? It's not this, but what exactly is it? And the place I want to go look at that comes uh, in our series. We're in a series called Won't You Love Your Neighbor? Not from the wisdom of Fred Rogers, but where he got it from Jesus. And last week we talked about the command to love your labor to love your neighbor. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you haven't heard that, you can go and uh, watch and catch up on the church app or online and the YouTube channel and hear the sermon to catch up with where we are. We're going to talk this week about the call to love your neighbor. The call. And the call to love your neighbor is the same as the call to follow Jesus. In fact, I would say it that way. The call to follow Jesus is a call to love your neighbor. If I said to you, hey, follow me out in the parking lot, would you think I was speaking metaphorically? Well, it must be some symbol, he means. It doesn't literally mean follow me out in the parking lot. No, you'd think, yeah, that's right, follow me out in the parking lot. And you would or you wouldn't. When Jesus says, follow me, what do we think he means? Is, he just, is this religious talk? 
I think he actually means follow him. He certainly did in the first century. What does he mean for us in the 21st century? How do we follow him? And we're going to look at the Gospel of Luke at three different snapshots, three scenes Luke gives us from Luke chapter 5 of what it means to follow Jesus, what this call really is. The first one's in Luke 5, verses 1 through 11. You can turn there or follow along on the screen. Luke 5, verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets began to break so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled their boat so full they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at his knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and his all, all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Now, this is a different kind of fish story, isn't it? Usually fish stories are you're by yourself and you talk about the one that got away. It was huge. You should have seen it, but nobody saw it, right? This is different. This is like there's lots of people there and nothing gets away. They're sinking the boats. There's so many fish. Obviously, Jesus is calling these men to follow him, and they do leave their boats and follow him. But something significant happens first that's very easy to miss. And we see it in the interaction between Jesus and Simon. Simon, if you're not new to reading the Gospels, gets renamed later Peter, same disciple. He, Peter is the, is the English translation of the Greek name Petros, meaning rock. He calls Peter the rock, Simon. We'll talk about him later. Peter is skeptical, isn't he, when Jesus has put out in the deep water the nets down. These are professional fishermen. He's like, we've been fishing all night. This is the wrong time in the middle of the day to go out fishing. I mean, we haven't caught anything, but, you know, you're Jesus, so what am I going to say? No? Okay, I'll do this. I'll humor you, you know? Like, you might know God and everything, but I know fish, Jesus. This is a bad idea, but what am I going to say? So he does it. And then what happens? The catch is, you know, they, he's fished all his life. He's, he's in business with, with James and John, and there's other fishermen that are helping them. These guys are professionals. They've never seen anything like this. And what's his reaction to the miraculous catch? What's Peter's reaction? Think about this. A professional fisherman with the greatest catch by far he's ever seen. Massive profit. Nothing like this has ever happened in his business before. Just this windfall. What's his reaction? Awesome! We can market this. Follow Jesus. Get fish. Like, this is amazing. This is the business plan of a, of a lifetime. What does he say? He falls on his knees and says, go away from me, Lord. This is the call that unsettles. The first part of the call, easy to miss. The call to follow also unsettles us, troubles us, brings us face to face with our inadequacy, or in biblical terms, our sin. I mean, Timothy Keller writes about this. He says that the, any true encounter with Jesus is, causes a kind of self-quake. You see yourself for who you really are, and it, you don't like it. It's overwhelming. It's humbling. It brings you to your knees. Well, just a simple example. Like if, if you think of yourself as really, really smart, and then you get around true genius, it's a little unsettling, isn't it? It's a little disturbing. It's like you realize, I'm not that smart. <laughs> I thought I was. If you see your identity as a smart person, and then you go off to college for the first time, maybe you're first in your class, but your class is all dumb, right? And you go off to college for the first time, right? And you realize, I'm not a genius. I don't know anything. It's troubling. Now think about that when it comes to the God of the universe. When you come into contact with, with omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, the Holy One of Israel, the, the God who put everything in place, when you get near to him, you don't, you don't, I, I talk to people sometimes and say, you know, you're a pastor, that's great, you know, but I don't feel close to God in church. I feel close to God like in the mountains, out on the lake. And God can be, you can be close to him out in the, on the lake, but I often will ask them, oh yeah, what does it feel like out on the lake? Oh, peaceful. 
Well, if, if, if you've never been unsettled, maybe it, that isn't God. That you're in, 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 no, don't misunderstand me. Peace comes. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But first, we face our sin. First, we shake. First, we kneel. First, we say, go away. I shouldn't be in your presence. We don't think about the, the call. We think, call, follow Jesus. Okay, let's follow. Let's go. The call first shakes us up, wakes us up, causes us to see us for who we really are. You become acutely aware of your own sin. This is the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 6. Some of you will know this passage, right? We sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, right? That comes out of this encounter Isaiah has in the temple of the Lord, a vision. And he says, go away. I, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And God says, your sin is taken away and your guilt is atoned for. And then Isaiah's response is, here am I, send me. Almost the same thing we see in Peter. Go away, Lord. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Come follow me. And he does. But the call to follow Jesus is first a call to face your own desperate need for him and for his grace. So Peter's response of go away from me is actually the best prerequisite to following him. His recognition of Jesus for who he really is and his confession of his own need is his resume, if you will. It's what it takes to follow Jesus. And notice something else. This call totally reshapes Peter's relationship with his work. Did you catch that? I mean, he leaves his boats and nets. Those are the tools of his trade. That's what he's built. He leaves the greatest prophet he's ever seen. So what does it mean? It means if you really want to follow Jesus, quit your job tomorrow. <laughs> it doesn't mean that, right? Some of you like, uh, uh, uh. No, it doesn't mean that. What it does mean is this. When, you, when your identity is reshaped by the grace of Jesus Christ, profit, success, ceases to be the most important thing in your life. Your career success, your financial success, your identity is no longer found in your business. It changes that relationship drastically. It reorders it. So your job and your career is, is not your identity anymore. What happens to your job and your career? It becomes a context in which you follow Jesus, in which he leads you. I've got a good friend who attends our church who says that Jesus is the CEO of his business. Now, all of his <laughs> employees think he's a CEO, but he says, no, good, Jesus is. He calls the shots. He's got a group trying to buy his business, saying they want to understand how it's so successful. And he tells them that God is the CEO. And they're like, uh, okay, buddy, tell us the real truth, you know. And he's like, no, it's the true truth. In other words, it's not his identity. It's the context in which he serves and follows Christ. Now, Luke continues the story to the next story. And we're going to see two encounters of healings and broken people. And these, are, these little snapshots are, uh, we could spend a, a sermon on each of them. But they tell us something together about Jesus' mission and what our mission should be if we're following him. They show us the heart of God. Now we could look at them from the perspective of what they tell us about God and his authority and power and love and glory. And we should look at them that way. And we have in, in past sermons. We could look at them in terms of the people who, who encounter him and are re restored. And we should look at them that way. I want to also look at them this morning from the perspective of those of us called to follow Jesus. It's not an accident or coincidence that right after Jesus calls these men to follow him and they leave their boats and nets, the next two stories are, are instructive for us. Where do they go? Where do they go when they follow him? Well, let's read. Luke 5, 12 through 16. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. No coincidence here that the very next encounter is with what we would call the, uh, like the, the most socially outcast person in that society. Now, a little, little biblical background and context. Leprosy in the Bible did not mean only what we would call Hansen's disease, the leprosy today. It, it was a whole range of skin disorders and issues that were debilitating and considered unclean. And because of the contagion, uh, these were 
people that have these diseases and disorders were out required by law jewish law legal law and moral religious law to live outside the city outside the camp in the old testament and they were not allowed in the temple so they couldn't come in and they couldn't have relationships with everybody else they couldn't be in community they couldn't be in worship they were excluded socially emotionally uh, in terms of economically and also religiously they're outsiders in every way but this guy's in the town we're told so the first question should be what's this leper doing in town he's breaking the law and he's risking his life actually because people would be in the, within their legal rights to have a, to call the religious leaders and have them stoned to death for being in town but he's in town maybe he's heard about jesus that with his healing powers and he comes to jesus and what does he say in verse 12 lord if you're willing, that moves me. He doesn't question Jesus' ability to heal. He, qu he wonders if Jesus is willing to heal. He thinks he can. He believes he can. But he wonders, is it available to me? Would you heal me? I mean, nobody has the time for me. I'm an outcast. Remember the woman who said, think I could have a hug? When Kim told that story, think, think I could have a hug? This is the heart of the leper here. Are you willing to heal me? Now, we know from the study of the Gospels that Jesus does not need to touch this leper to, to heal him. He could stand at a distance and say, be clean. He could speak a word. You don't have to, you wouldn't have to say anything. He could heal by a look. But the text is very specific here. He says he reaches out his hand and touches the man and says, I am willing. Think about the order there. The touch comes first. He touches him. How long had it been since that woman had been hugged? In a caring, loving way. Touched not as an object of ridicule or desire, but as somebody who mattered. How long had this man lived outside the city and no one had ever touched him other than maybe another leper? Jesus touches him. And he says, I'm willing. Be clean. And instantly, he's clean. If you're willing, he says. And Jesus says, I am. This is the call that cleanses. Notice, Jesus says, don't tell anybody this. Just show yourself to the priest, and he'll pronounce you cl clean through the rituals that cleanse you. He'll, he'll determine that you actually are already clean. Now, throughout all of human history, scientifically, medically speaking, when a clean thing comes in contact with an, un with an unclean thing, what happens? When somebody who's healthy comes in contact with someone who's sick, has it ever worked that someone who does not have a cold comes in contact with someone who does have a cold and heals them and, and makes, them, makes the cold go away? Does it work that way? It's not a trick question. No, it does not work that way, right? You catch the cold. You catch the disease. When the clean thing comes in contact with the unclean thing, we know this medically, the, uncle, the clean thing becomes unclean. It becomes contaminated. And religiously, this is the way it was viewed in Jesus' day and sometimes in our day too. When the clean thing comes in contact with the unclean thing, the, uh, the clean thing is defiled, unclean. But not with Jesus. Jesus is the one person in human history who can say, I am cleanness. And so when you come in contact with me, you who are unclean become clean by my touch, by, my, by encountering me. Jesus does not show you how to get clean, like do these things, pray these prayers, read these scriptures, you know, go to church, give this much, serve this much, and then, you know, God will sort of clean you up. He says, I'm willing, be clean. He is cleanness. Just his touch. So it does not matter who you are, what you've done. This is what makes Naomi's house so tender to me. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, or how unclean you think you are. I love what Chris said. Did you catch it? She said, I'm not that different from these women. Now on the outside, she's very different. She's, she's, you know, she's the quintessential suburban mom. I know her and know her family well. Love her. But she's saying, where it really matters, I'm not that different. It might be covered in layers of looking good and have my life together on the outside, but inside, I have just as much brokenness and need of God's grace as these people who are visibly broken and lost. One of the great dangers, I think, for us living in the suburban tri-cities is to think we're fine. You're to think he's fine or she's fine. 
You're not, by the way, <laughs> which I think you know. Well, what do you do about that? You don't have to clean up your act to come to Jesus. I've talked to people who said to me, you know, I, I like to come to church, but I gotta get some things straightened out first. <laughs> That's like saying, I'll go to the gym once I get in shape. I did that for years. It doesn't work. <laughs> he is cleanness. He cleans you. This is a, so simple, but so profound. So think about this. Jesus says, follow me. I'm going to give you a new assignment, a new way to fish. And where do they follow him? Well, right out of the streets to the most unclean, socially outcast person in that society. And Jesus brings him in, into community, into relationship, makes him clean. And then we see that Jesus, uh, this, little, this, little bit, this little bit here in verses five, 15 and 16. Now remember, we're learning how to follow Jesus. So follow Jesus, you're going to go to the outcasts. It's the call that, that, that unsettles us, shakes us up, face our own sin, and it's the call that cleanses on the outside and on the inside. And then we see this little bit here where, where Jesus, the news about him spread all the more so that everywhere he went, people wanted something from him to be healed. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like people, everywhere I go, somebody wants something from me? I just can't. I, so I have a friend who says, I'm not trying to please everybody, just trying not to make anybody else mad. You ever feel that way in your life? I'm just trying to get, just, just keep my head above water. I just, so much to do, I can't get it all done. We tend to think of Jesus as this sort of wandering hippie guy who said wise things and healed people, but didn't have much to do, you know? Didn't like have a real job or anything. Didn't have demands on his time. He was, in his three years of public ministry, the busiest human who ever lived. More people, crowds about him everywhere he went. And what does he do? He withdraws to pray often. So what does following Jesus mean? It means being aware of our own sin, going to the outcasts, and going to the Father in prayer. Let's look at the next little story, verses 17 through 26. The next little snapshot. This, this story is, uh, is one of my favorites, and it deserves an entire sermon, and we've had entire sermons on it in the past. Let's, let's read. One day he was teaching, uh, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there, and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men carrying a paralytic on a mat and tr uh, came and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. And they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd. They went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking. How great is that? And asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins? He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he'd been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed, you think, and gave praise to God. And they were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. This is an incredible scene. I love this scene. First of all, uh, let, let's set the scene. Jesus is in a house. Now, where are the two scenes we've already been? Jesus calls people to follow him. The first one is out on the streets. The second one is in a home. This sounds like neighborhood stuff to me. It's not in like church work, but it's in real life, in, on the streets and in homes and neighborhoods. The, the house is jammed with people. Leaders have come from, religious leaders from all the way as far away as Jerusalem, all over the area to hear Jesus. And there, there's no, there's standing room only. People are stuffing their faces in the windows. You can't even get in. Four friends bring their paralyzed buddy. These are good friends to Jesus. Hearing that this guy might be able to heal him. Maybe they've heard stories about lame walking and lepers being made clean. They bring him. They can't get in. I, this is my favorite part, right? Well, they're not going to be deterred. They don't go home like, well, we missed him. We'll get tickets, tickets next week, you know. Like, we, we came this far. We're going we're gonna to bring him to Jesus. So they tear apart the roof. Now think about that. They got to judge where Jesus is standing. You ever try to find the stud without a stud finder? Oh, nope, nope. I got 12 holes in my wall, you know. So like they dig a little hole. I'm guessing they dig a little hole. Look, no, to the left. Dig a little hole. Stuff's falling down, you know, on the roof. And, and Jesus is teaching. Maybe stuff's falling on him. I would be very annoyed. But he, Jesus is not. Then they lower the guy down on a mat, which means four guys with four ropes lowered him down, trying to keep him level. Can you imagine being that guy? Uh, don't drop me, you know, like, you can't move. you just, this is a bad idea, this is a bad idea, this is a bad idea, right? <laughs> right at Jesus' feet. And he's laying there. 
And, he, and he's, I can imagine him going like, sorry, sorry, Jesus. I uh, told him not to, but he's paralyzed, you know. He's laying there on his feet. And Jesus doesn't get distracted. He's not annoyed. He's not like, what are you doing? I'm in the middle of my lesson. Come back later. This is not prayer time. He sees their faith. And he says, your sins are forgiven. Think about that. The guy's like, mm, thank you. But I can't walk, right? It's not what he asked for. It's not what his friends brought him for. But Jesus knows it's what he needs. He's saying, in effect, you've got two debilitating diseases, not one. Your physical paralysis is not actually your deepest problem. It's your soul. It's your sin. Let's deal with that. This is the real healing. And he says your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and religious leaders are listening going, who does this guy think he is? This is the call that forgives. Only God can forgive sin. Only God can forgive sin. Yes, exactly right. That's the point. Only God can. And this is God we're talking about. This is God who's calling you. This is God who we're trying to follow. This is God who's cleansing us and healing us and restoring us and sending us. And Jesus serves them. And this is, by the way, if you ever wonder what are all the miracles for, this tells you. This tells you why the miracles are given in the Bible. Jesus says, which is easier, to say get up and walk or to say your sins are forgiven? Well, let me ask you the same question. Which is easier? If you're honest, most of you would say, well, actually, for me, it'd be easier to say your sins are forgiven because then there's no pressure. You can't tell, right? But get up and walk, that's like you got to actually get up and walk. But that's actually backwards. Jesus says, so you will know. He knows their thoughts. He knows their hearts. He knows what they're, what they're thinking. He says, so you'll know who I am, the authority that I actually have to forgive sin, that I, this is, that who this is standing in front of you. I say, get up and walk. And the guy does. Why? The physical healing is not the point. The point is the authority and power of Jesus to forgive. That's the point. That's who we're called to follow. And that's what he does. The physical healing is meant to point to that, to show us that. That's why the miracles are given, to demonstrate the authority and the power of God. We get fixated on the physical stuff, don't we? God, give me this job. God, fix this relationship. God, heal my wife. And, and, and it's not wrong to pray those things. We can and we should pray those. And sometimes God answers and sometimes he heals miraculously. But I'll tell you what God does 100% of the time if you cry out and ask is forgive. The real healing, the tougher miracle, what really matters. What's easier? To make somebody walk? Human doctors can do that. But transform a heart? Cleanse a soul? Only God can do that. Only God can do that. And that's precisely what he does. This is the call that forgives. And it happens in an instant. It's not like, okay, here's what you're going to have to do. Uh, wash in this way, go through these actions, pray this way, and then you'll be cleansed, you'll be healed. It just happens, like the touch. How does it happen? How does this happen? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 tells us that he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. And my favorite, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word righteousness is used twice there, and I've talked about this before. Some of you will know this. I hope you know it. If it's new to you, it's not a word we use all the time, is it, in common language? Did you, did you, this week at work, did you say, hey, Bill, how's your righteousness doing? You know? No, probably not. It literally means right relationship with, to be right with. How does a man or a woman be made right with God? This is showing us. In Christ. God made him who knew no sin, he's perfect, he's holy, he's God, to become sin for us so that in him we might get right with God. 
When Jesus calls us to follow him, it's not just go do good stuff, be a nice person, don't swear, you know, and, and be kind and, and know your neighbor's name and they do a nice act now and then. That's all good stuff, right? But that's not the call. The call is to fall on my knees and fall on your knees and say, Lord, I'm broken. I don't you can put me back together if you're willing. And he says, I'm willing. He picks you up and says, don't be afraid. I've got work for you to do. Follow me. There's a whole bunch of people just like you. Some of them are broken on the outside, and it's obvious. Some of them are broken on the inside, and you can't see it as easily. Let's go. Follow me. Well, where are we going? I'll show you. Outcasts, outsiders, friends bringing people that, dragging them to Jesus, clawing their way to get to him, seeing lives put back together. That's what Christians do. Right? What do Christians do? That's what we do. We follow Jesus because we've had our lives rearranged and our identity changed and, are, and we're put back together by him and healed and restored and made whole. Cleansed, forgiven the whole, everything, right? So what do we do? What can we do? I'm going to follow you. In my place of work, in the school that I attend, in my home and in my neighborhood and everywhere I go, the best I can, I get it wrong sometimes and I screw it up and I forget and I get about my own agenda, but God, you, you're patient with me and you love me and you redirect me and you send me to people who don't know you so that you can use me, me, humble, messed up me to help people's lives get put back together. That's what Jesus followers do, friends. That's what the church is supposed to do. And I know for many of us, it's, oh, I forget. I'm scrambling to get the kids dressed and get here on time and, and show up. And, oh, that was a good song. And that sermon wasn't terrible. And we go back to our lives. What are our lives? Your life is the context in which you follow Jesus. What are we going to do, right? We're going to be out there shaking bananas? <laughs> Just, what are Christians doing? Or pointing people to the one who cleanses forgives, heals, restores. That's what we do. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that you call us. We're not worthy of this call. We can't even answer it unless you call first. And by your grace, you enable us to follow. We're not capable of following you in our own strength. We don't even want to. But you call us and you cleanse us, and you forgive us, and you restore us, and you invite us to follow you to others to do the same. We know, God, we can cleanse nobody, we forgive no one, only you do that. But what a great privilege that we get to follow you and, and be used by you to help others. Thank you. Help us by your strength to truly love you and to love our neighbors. This is what it means to follow you. We thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.